Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for SAS Innovate 2024. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, Dave Vellante, my co-host, head of CUBE Research. We've got a great guest, CUBE alumni, Jason Mann, Vice President of the IoT Internet of Things at SAS. Great to see you, Jason. Thanks for coming back on. Great to be back. So we had a great yeah. chat last year about the IoT space and SAS's role in it. What's the new innovations? What are you guys doubling down on? What's AI play in terms of the analytics and sustainability? Big part of the story. What is the, what's the key message there? Absolutely, we're starting to see exponential interest around sustainability. And, and the goal is to leverage this you know, vast network of sensors that are in place uh, and then apply that to the efforts to reduce power uh, consumption, for example. Uh, worker safety, there's a lot of these initiatives that are, that are driving um, a, a big change in how it's addressed in the market today. Can you so, give an example? Right, go ahead, please. Yeah, give an example, yeah. give a couple examples. So, so uh, it, a, a huge space that we're seeing right now is, is a goal of reducing energy consumption. Um, so SAS has a solution called energy cost optimization and it's focused uh, primarily in providing insight to the energy utilization across the processes within the company. Um, again, sensors, uh, the price has gotten so cheap, it's almost a, a level of fidelity that's uh, almost sensory uh, in, in, in its effort. <laughs> and they're able to take this information and provide insight into specific areas within the operations that are using the most energy, for example. Or where you have multiple lines, you're able to comp uh, compare lines against others to determine why there's variation. Um, a lot of these companies today are facing both uh, federal and internal uh, mandates to reduce their overall carbon footprint. And um, as I said, we're seeing exponential growth in the space. So cost of sensors are coming down, exactly. but it's kind of like the dimmer, dimmer thing and switch in your house. Sure. Put them everywhere, yeah. it's like, it adds up. But there's other costs <laughs> too. There's silicon, yeah. there's data, there's analytics, there's labor, there's infrastructure around that. So how, how are you seeing that balance, the yin and, and yang, and how is SAS addressing that? Yeah, I think the, the cost is, is extended, certainly out, outside of the sensors themselves. You think about the network cost uh, yep. and being able to move data with this explosion of the amount of sensors, you have this analogous explosion in the amount of data and being able to determine how to reduce the footprint, the, the amount that you push through the pipe is, is a, key, um, a key point of interest for many of our customers. We also have the, the landing zone, so once it, it moves through the network, you're going to have to have storage for it, and as we're all familiar within cloud storage, mm -hmm. that's a cost that can rapidly expand itself. What's the, what's the challenge for the customer? What's their big pain point in doing this? Obviously, cost and sustainability, huge factors, we get that. What are the, some of the challenges that they're facing, and what are you guys doing to help them overcome that? Can you, can you well, unpack well, I, that a little bit more? Yeah, I think, um, as an example, we, we have a customer that, that's uh, one of the largest brick manufacturers in the world, based in Altria, uh, Wienerberger. And, and one of their, their hurdles is to move um, these types of projects out of uh, POC land. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places uh, the projects go to die, right? <laughs> so being able to move out of, out of POC and, and distribute. So um, what we have is an experience with them over the last year to where they were seeing just in the pilot about 9% overall reduction in their energy cost. Um, and so then it's that next step. It's the problem that you're talking about. Now how do we get this deployed? and we were able to work with them to deploy it into the first couple factories, uh, distributed across uh, the end-to-end -end process, and they actually realized about 15% cost reduction, and now, uh, as like a phase two, they're going to 200 plus factories. So you're saying the challenge is the POCs just don't make it, or they get distracted, or they don't understand how to use the data. Is, is that the real problem? Yeah, you do, uh, a lot of the POCs aren't designed to transition into enterprise scale, uh, and, and you, know, you, you put yeah. a lot of people okay. against the project, but it doesn't transfer, and, and being able to have a product that can understand and deliver insight, not just in a POC environment, but in real life is, is key. Can we dig into an example, and, and I want to understand exactly where you play and where you don't play, and let's use your computer vision as an example, and think about full self-driving. When you guys do fraud detection, you're doing it in near real time or real time. Correct. So you got to do real time at, at the edge with automotive and there are thousands of applications like that. A lot of that data is not sent back mm -hmm. to the cloud. A lot of it's done real time and disposed of. Uh, but, but 
five percent of a lot is still a lot. <laughs> <Certainly>. <laughs> yes. So where do you guys play? Are you at the full end of that? Obviously, the analytics can go back to the cloud. Are you doing you know real time in that example at IoT? Where do you fit? Where don't you fit? I think the the easy answer is wherever decision is required. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what we're finding is in the market today, obviously, the, the cloud adoption, but we're starting to see more and more um, architectures that require a hybrid version. So mm -hmm. you, you have your cloud storage, but you're moving to aggregation points that may be co-located to where the data is being generated. So decisioning sometime is needed there. Or it may go all the way to the sensor or the camera, as you mentioned, computer vision, where you need an insight generated at the time of, of the action and you're not doing the full loop of moving the data all the way through the network back to the cloud for decisioning. You enact there and then publish alerts from that point. So obviously automotive is, is, is one, I mean, I look at it, you look at it, I'm up for a new car, I'm looking at your car, pretty nice car, <laughs> but there's sensors it, it everywhere. Gasoline, Dave. There's cameras <laughs> everywhere, there's sensors everywhere, there's of course, of course microprocessors behind them. Obviously industry 4.0, manufacturing, you know, energy exploration, I mean, where's there not? sensors and computer vision. I, I, I think uh, that's, that's exactly right. It's, if you can put a camera and monitor something, yeah. you, you have the ability to generate insight from that. Um, one area that we're seeing, again, a lot of interest as of late is around worker safety. Um, in, in the industrial sector, you know, obviously yeah. there's, there's a lot of dangerous jobs that are out there, mm -hmm. and, and it's critical for employers to be able to define safe spaces and then monitor it to make sure that the employees are following the rules. The best way to do that is to leverage the cameras that are already in place, so it's, it's uh, generating further ROI from infrastructure that exists. So they can create a geofence, then use the cameras to monitor the employee actions and use it in twofold, either to you know, catastrophic capabilities, you want to generate a, a, an equipment stoppage, for example. But you also have the, the carrot part of it where it's yeah. training and positive reinforcement to change <laughs> behavior. You know, Dave, I was ask, asking Brian Harris in the media briefing a question, and I remember his keynote, it's kind of a dumb question that I asked. I'm like, was that a good question? His response that he I prompted him for was about multimodal. The vision brings up the whole AI. You got cameras, and what I didn't realize in my question is, they've been doing this for 47 years. Yeah, I, so I, <laughs> IOT, cameras are huge. So it's industrial, so it's OT-like environment, now IT-enabled cloud. You got, you got multiple modes, you get LLMs, you're going to have all kinds of stuff. How's the Gen AI going to piece into there? I mean, obviously sustainability check, worker safety check, very responsible, good job. Okay, put it, put it on the side. Sure. Table stakes. Other innovation, Gen AI, what's coming next? I'm imagining you can have all kinds of cool stuff with cameras, video, audio, I mean sounds, tables, graphs. I mean, if you're running these environments, you're going to have a very diverse data set. At, absolutely, so um, you know, I, I think one of the, the big advancements as we start to talk about topics like generative AI is you, you start to expand the engagement of analytics and the outcome that analytics can provide to a much broader population. We get outside of the, the data scientists mm -hmm. and now you're looking at operators. So, um, so where we're seeing the most advancement is doing that translation of what had historically been a, a, a quite um, deep dive in, into assessment of yeah. process to something that's conversational. What is my biggest area of concern on line three? Where are we seeing the most areas of failure in uh, you know, operation B? And it really can be an engagement at that conversational level, and that's what Gen AI is doing. You know, we heard, Dave and I, we've been, how many cyber shows did we do last year? Yeah. I think it was at the um, Google Mandian show, the threat, mostly threat detection stuff. But one of the things that came out of there in Gen AI was, it does all the security reports for you. Mm. One of the biggest pain in the butts was for CISOs was doing the incident reports. The Paper run book. Paperwork, <laughs> yes. okay? Yes. So I know this compliance is a huge part of the IOT, your area, where there's worker safety. Do you see that to be a hot area where there's a lot of assistance coming in on the compliance side, just like from one, monitoring, you said safe spaces, to, to reports. All that stuff, probably all that heavy lifting. A absolutely, compliance and, and there's inspection uh, capability or, or requirements, especially within the heavy industrial space. Uh, we, we have a customer here that, that's speaking at the event, uh, George Pacific, and um, they were wanting to be able to expedite time to resolution for potential yeah. issues that pop up on the line. So historically, if a machine threw an error code, as an example, uh, you have to go to a system to look up the error code. Then you go to another system to look up how to repair it. Then you go to another system to understand in the past, how was this resolved? And they're using a convergence of all that data uh, aligned with Gen AI initiatives to be able to bring all of that and put it on a platter to the, to the operator. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I'm impressed about what you guys are doing on the prompt, prompt storage, I love those, and the models is across industries. 
Right, yeah. and that's a huge deal, and it's your models, which is sure. a great announcement. What are good candidates for some of the vision stuff and the, the multimodal? Uh, what industries are a good sweet spot to, to or low hanging fruit to saying, okay, we can see immediate value. Yeah. What could um, you outline and unpack where you see low hanging fruit, immediate value, great use cases to get started? Yeah, so I think it's, it's very similar to, to what we've seen across the history of IoT and it plays into these industrials and these industrial use cases. So manufacturing, transportation, energy. Um, we're also starting to see an expansion into government because they have many of, of similar uh, use cases there where they're having to provide early alerting and you're starting to see a transition of that go into what I would call environmental risk, right? So flood protection, yeah. fire protection, yeah. because it's still leveraging very similar types of sensors and you're providing a very similar uh, objective. I want early yeah. warning to a particular state that needs to be resolved. You know, it's interesting, Dave, we, were, we, we cover a lot of the public sector market with theCUBE, obviously the convergence of private-public partnerships, smart cities, all these government and agencies. There's an opportunity with Gen AI to actually serve citizens better. And imagine yeah. like the demos we saw on stage where you can democratize SaaS tooling for city workers. You get cameras everywhere, so you don't have to be a power user or data scientist with some of these Gen AI, Gen AI tools. So that'll probably create a lift for you guys in these other markets where you now have more users out there. Users, consumers, those that can engage directly, absolutely, the population will expand drastically with the use of these conversational infrastructures yeah. like Gen AI and LLMs. Yeah. Cool. Do you see it as a, a big disruptor or is it where incumbents are now just sort of applying the latest and greatest AI and sort of solidifying their, their position? How do you think about that? Yeah, the, the disruptor is, is access. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really moving up at an exponential scale of those that can get the, the benefits of, of analytics or analytics for AIoT and, and be at arm's length. And that arm's length is a conversational engagement that, that Gen AI is providing. So it really is about broad consumption. Mm. How does SAS look at the ethical considerations around AI and IoT solutions around data privacy? Obviously we heard on stage the, the, the statement, you know, we protect the data. They were very clear about we're not using foundation models or LLMs that are you know, the ones that are most known. This is data that the customer owns. There's always that gray area of, wait, is that my data or is it the customer data? So how do you view the privacy piece of it? It's super important. It's going to be critical. You mentioned also the computer vision. So personally identifiable data is oftentimes picked up through cameras. So I think understanding the biases and the risk that are associated with that type of generalized data capture or generalized inferencing from globally available data is always going to provide a risk and it's one that we have to closely monitor. Let me ask you a question if you don't mind. If you, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Obviously IoT can't stop thinking about the edge. It's the next area that's going to get massively disrupted in a good way. Mm. Obviously the user experience at the edge as things get smaller, faster, cheaper, sure. more intelligent. With Gen AI you're going to have more from device to inside the, to the cloud. It's going to be a hot area and obviously IoT is going to play there. What's your view of the readiness <laughs> of that market? Because remember the OT and IT conversion is still happening. I think AI accelerates it for mm. sure. Uh, how ready is the market in your opinion and where are they in the progress bar? If you can peg a, a spot of kind of the transition from you know, one to 10, 10 being fully immersed. Um, I, I think they're ready today. And, and the first movers have already been there. They're moving on to second and third iter iterations of, of these projects that are returning high value. Um, we, we talked about the sensors yeah. and, and I mean, even if you're not there today, it's such a quick start to deploy these, these elements that are the foundation for that insight, the, the turnaround of value is rapid. I, you know, I, I feel like sometimes large language model is a misnomer, especially when we talk about IoT, because it's, so, it's an event-driven environment. Now maybe it's different AI for that, but how, yeah. I wonder if you could comment on that. Is, is it really like event-driven models as opposed to large language models? Yes, I, I understand there's a natural language interface and that's where the LLMs mm -hmm. come in, but it seems like the, the AI has greater power, whether it's systems of agencies or co-pilots, to actually drive events. It is, so I, I think that's where you, you see the convergence of, of IoT analytics and, mm -hmm. and Gen AI, or large language models, is oftentimes we are looking for an event, but it's for a purpose. It's an yeah. event for correction, it's an event for risk. So being able to combine the two provides yeah. the basis for the outcome. So we can identify the event, Gen AI or the LLMs can provide a, a yeah. path to resolution to correct that. Yeah, so I'm it really not, is where the two meet. Yeah, and I think the stream processing and video is going to be a huge part because 
that's going to be such a good volume. And again, they're going to be deployed at street lights to wherever on the networks, everywhere at the edge. But the volume of data coming in up, that's going to be massive. It and is. so you got the volume, velocity, and, 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 and data volume. AI is perfect fit there to do heavy lifting. That's where the algorithms come in. I like this is where, Dave, you heard from Brian saying, hey, you know, we're going to make a better question, better answer. I think this is going to be an area where you're going to have a big pile of data, and I think you will see some new innovation. What, what, do, you, what do you expect to see there in that area? Because it's going to be one of the hottest areas. Yeah, I think we've, we've far surpassed the ability for humans to consume and, and evaluate this type of data. Um, and that's where you're going to continue to, to see advancements. I think um, the biggest change you'll see over the next you know, 12, 18, 24 yeah. months is the idea of autonomy within these yeah. processes. So no longer are you going to have a human in the loop yeah. making the final decision to make the correction. You're going to ask the yeah. equipment to correct itself yeah. based Dave, on that Dave, data. Dave's team doing a big research uh, project right now. We're digging in, we started, started uh, six months ago. It's called, we call it the Uber for the enterprise. And yeah. where you have, Uber has cars and, and users, people, places, and things. But it's a cutting edge example of the kind of environment you're dealing with. Real time, third party, device, contract, <laughs> the driver of the car, or the company, a lot of databases are involved, a lot of data is involved to make things happen in real time. Uh, and you're in the middle of it, the edge. This is, this is, a, this is a hot area because that's where the users are. That's where the point of the, the contact is. Sure, sure. Um, do you have enough data? I never thought I'd ask that question because we were like, data is so plentiful, it's like insights were lacking. But now you hear that, well, AI is running out of data. And so you hear all this <laughs> synthetic data. Sure. So, and I know in our case with our LLM, it's like if the data's not there, it'll. SLM, it, small it, language. It's, it is an, S, it's a, an SLM. Yeah. yeah, but <laughs> it'll make stuff up if the data's not. It's like Swiss cheese. If there's a hole, it'll go find it and it'll grab from the, the full parts. And so you want to try to plug those holes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have enough data? Or do right. you have to create synthetic data to get quality Many, many times you don't. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a lot of drivers as to why you may not have data. Sometimes you're looking for rare events. Mm -hmm. So you need to create data that'll replicate those rare events so you can create modeling. Sometimes the access to the data is a disruption. So you want to move the evaluation and the analytics yeah. outside of the process and, and uh, oftentimes you create data for that. Mm -hmm. And then um, other times there's, there's risk to, to sharing data, personally identifiable data or yeah, data, yeah. you know, patient data is, is another great example uh, where you have to create that and then you reduce the risk for that being um, released into the public. So, yeah. so, so there's way specific examples for synthetic data. It's not just like making up data on the fly. There's a reason why you're using it. That's what you're saying. A absolutely, and it has to, to represent data from a real world application. So in that case of, of PII or, or uh, you know, healthcare data, which is very sensitive, yes. obviously. You, it, it, you know, the easiest way to say no, you know, you just, you can't look at it, but that doesn't solve the problem. So what right. you're saying is you create from the meta, either the metadata or you anonymize that data and then create synthetic data that replicates that without being able to identify an individual. That's something that you would do and you've got technology to do That's that. That's yes. That actually works today. That, that, absolutely, yeah. and, and whether it's patient data or a critical yeah. process, mm -hmm. uh, both yeah. of those, you know, you're at risk of, of impacting either operations or, or exposing a personal data, so both are a driver. Interesting, on the critical okay. process, there still could be IP leakage even if there's, there's yeah. Uh, well, yeah, anonymized exactly data. To your point, yeah. it's not about the data, right. I mean, that's one element of using the data, but also there's use cases where it's well formed, well understood, so it's just use fake data to test the models to accelerate yeah. the either yeah. forecasting or reasoning or reinforced learning. There's going to be so much action. I, I guess what, the, the final question I want to ask you, Chase, is we got to know you last year in theCUBE, We've seen each other throughout the year and met some of your team members. Um, great work at SAS you guys are doing. Really appreciate you taking the time to come Thank on theCUBE. Next year when we sit in here talking, what are we going to be talking about next year? Um, last year we talked about digital twins and you brought more to the table this year. The, yeah. the company's delivering on some of those points which we generated last year, yep. our, our Explorer's last event. When we come back next year, what are you going to be talking about? I, I think we're starting to see a, a bit more confidence in autonomy, as I mentioned earlier. I think when we're talking next year, we're going to talk about self-healing processes that are existing within manufacturing environments, high-speed environments, to where the correction happens without human intervention at all. Yeah, right in the moment. All right, yeah, next level. <laughs> Every year, it's the next level of innovation. Jason Mann, Vice President of IoT at SAS. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest. All day, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Stay with us all day here in Las Vegas with Innovate24. Thanks for watching, we'll be right back. <laughs>